Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel and this is the one I suspect some of you, well I know some of you, have been waiting for. This is my review of Ridley Scott's new film, Napoleon. Now I've put off reviewing it for about 10 days now. I went to go and see it on opening night at the IMAX Theatre in Sheffield. And there I was joined by my dad and my brother, which was very nice, the Richardson men on a nice night out. But I also bumped into Alex from Storm of Steel. Now, I posted his review on a um, just a, you know a, a YouTube post earlier on in the week. So I hope you've checked that out as well, because I will agree with 99% of what he had to say. He's also got a fantastic channel, Storm of Steel. It has a lot of lard content on there, so Two Fat Lardies is a rules publisher here in the UK, and he absolutely loves all their stuff, and a lot of their stuff is very good, so I cannot fault him for it. In fact, I think his last Battle Report video was uh, Sharp Practice, which is their Napoleonic Large Skirmish game. So once you've finished here, go and check Alex's Storm of Steel channel out. It, it is absolutely worth it. Now, one of the reasons why I have waited so long before doing this review is I wanted to give a few people a chance to go and see it. I wanted to just go over it in my own mind as well and you know digest it a little bit. And perhaps most importantly, I went to see it last Wednesday and then last Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I was at Lord of the Rings tournament. <laughs> so that's that's another reason why as well. I thought about doing it midweek, but I thought nope, I'll save it for this Sunday and you know I'll I'll just let it stew for a couple of more days. I've tried to avoid as many reviews of it as I can. I watched Alex's because we were in the same screening together. I was I was curious as to see what his thoughts on it were. And uh, I've seen quite a lot of, particularly on Facebook, popular historians or perhaps novelists giving their one or two line reviews of the film. Now, I don't want to do that here because it is an epic piece of work. It is like two and a half hours long. And I think just to say, yeah, it was the best film I've ever seen or no, it was complete dreck, don't go and see it. I don't think that really does the film a huge amount of justice, to be honest. So I'm going to give my overall verdict here. I don't want to bury the lead too much, but I'm going to ask you to stick with me while I go through different aspects of the film, particularly if you've seen it, because I, it's not all one thing or another, which is quite fitting, really, because I think it's quite complex, a little bit like Napoleon himself was. So I'm not going to bury the lead. I'm going to go straight in with my overall sort of out, stars out of 10 kind of thing. And even here, I am going to prevaricate. I am going to separate it into three different categories and award a star rating for each one of those. The first one will be as a war film. The second one will be as a non-war film. Uh, well, more on that in a bit. And the third category I will give it is as a war film for Napoleonic war gamers. So, number one, as a war film. Scores out of ten, I'm going to go with... Three. I thought about it. I thought four, mm, two, mm, it's around about there. No, I'm going to stick with three. The reason why I'm going to stick with three is there's not actually that much warring in it. The warring that is in it is completely ahistorical, completely inaccurate. Frankly, it's it's embarrassingly ridiculous. However, the stuff that you do see is reasonably good representation. I'll get more into that later on. The second one is as a non-war film. So this is if you go into it thinking it's going to be perhaps a melodrama, perhaps a character study, perhaps a historical epic. With this one, I'm going to go slightly better. I'm going to give it 4 out of 10. So the performances are pretty good. There's a couple of standout performances for my money. Is it really a great melodrama? So just a, a quick aside about me here. Because uh, <laughs> i got to make it all about me, obviously. Um, I, I So I'd heard quite early on that it wasn't a war film. It was going to be a melodrama. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, oh, God, I hate melodramas. And then I remembered that my favourite films of all time are films like Casablanca or Gone with the Wind. And I'm like, hang on a minute. I love melodramas. So actually, I don't mind a melodrama. This one is certainly no Casablanca. And it's not even a Gone with the Wind, I'm afraid. Four's potentially a little harsh. If you if you wanted to die on the hill that it was worth 5 out of 10, I'd probably let you have that one. But if you wanted to tell me that it's like 8 out of 10, then I think we would have a disagreement. So 4 out of 10 as a non-war film. Now, finally, as a uh, Napoleonic nerd, 
what does it score out of 10? Now, for me, this is, this is it's, again, it's a tough one. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 on this one. And this is going to be very, very, very controversial. A lot of people really hated that there's no formations, there's no uh, battle prep or anything like that. Well, that's the, I'm including all that in Is It a Good War film? What I'm thinking about here are the characters, uh, who you see on screen, basically, the uniforms, we'll certainly get more onto the uniforms, and the overall look of the film as well. The Not so much the mise-en-scene, but more the, the set dressing, how it looks, how it's been, how the period has been portrayed by Ridley Scott. And for me, I think I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Um, I'll explain why later on. But we're going to break down those uh, those things. And I think going in, we need to consider a few things. So the first thing I want to consider is it's not a war film. Now, the trailer very much presented it as a war film. The fact that the soundtrack was Black Sabbath's War Pigs, which is all about, you know, it's all about the First World War. And the scenes that it showed are all the action stuff with a little bit of romance and sex thrown in. Uh, indicated to me that it was going to be a war film. However, I had read interviews with Ridley Scott where they said, no, no, it's not a war film. So that wasn't a surprise to me. I think it may have been for quite a few people. And I can understand why, because the trailer certainly portrayed that it was going to be a war film. If you've not seen the film yet, I would estimate... Now, I didn't have a stopwatch. I thought about going to see it again, and I didn't. So that <laughs> that tells you something, doesn't it? But I would say of the two and a half hour running time, there is may maybe half an hour spent on the battlefield. Maybe. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd probably say about half an hour. So about 20% of the film is spent on the battlefield. So it's not a war film. When you consider that that 20% of the film includes the Battle or the Siege of Toulon, the Battle of the Pyramids, the Battles of Austerlitz, Borodino, and Waterloo, that's not a huge amount of time to cover all of those battles. I was trying to think, was there another battle as well? But um, one does not spring to mind in the film. But anyway, if it was in there, it was clearly not, uh, not particularly interesting or exciting. Next up, I want to talk about the performances. Wacky Phoenix's... Napoleon, he is in basically every scene of the film. Not quite, but pretty much. He was, he was, he was, he was okay. He, he was, he was all right. He was, he was better than okay. He was probably seven out of ten. He portrayed Napoleon in a very specific way. I'm going to get into that a bit later on. But the way he portrayed him, whether you agree with it or disagree with, that's what Napoleon was actually like. I think he portrayed that character quite well. They didn't age him or de-age him throughout the whole film, which made it a little bit weird. He's the same age when he's on Elba as he is when he's witnessing Marie Antoinette's head get cut off, Which more of which in a bit. Now, if someone hasn't been aged by 25 years of near-constant warfare, including the retreat from Moscow, then... <laughs> I don't know who their dermatologist is, but he's doing a good job. So I'm very surprised they didn't either use different actors or the modern de-aging technology, which is a little bit hit and miss, admittedly, but it would have given a bit more of a sense of a journey of this man's life. And that's something that I feel was really missing from the film. Again, I want to get more into that. This is just opening remarks, really. Vanessa Kirby plays Josephine. Now, going in, I thought she was too young. Originally, it was cast to be Jodie Comer, who would have been way too young. Vanessa Kirby, also too young, but I thought she played Josephine superbly. Really, really good. I want to get more into that later on. Her performance is almost worth going to see for her performance alone. If you'd called it Josephine, maybe it wouldn't have been so box office, but it might have been a little bit more of an accurate depiction of the film. There are a few of the supporting roles I thought were very well played as well. Uh, Talleyrand and Kulankor were pretty good. As was Barra. Now Barra was played by I can't remember the guy's name. He's a uh, he's I think he's an Algerian. He was the star of A Prophet, which was an absolutely incredible film. So he is a very good actor. I didn't mind him very much. I thought he was very good. But overall, and you can clip this for the DVD release trailer. There was a dream that was a great Napoleon movie, and this Proximo was not it. There is talk of a longer director's cut coming out. Apparently it's going to be about four hours, so it's going to add another hour and a half. I probably will watch it. However, I think there are problems that it might solve. I think there are problems that it absolutely will not solve. And we'll get into that in a bit. Ridley Scott has a bit of a history of having quite poor theatrical 
released films, only to be improved by the director's cut. So Blade Runner would be perhaps the most obvious one. One I've spoken about quite a lot recently is Kingdom of Heaven. I still haven't seen the uh, director's cut. I'm going to watch it over Christmas, but I'm told that that is much better than the original. However, he has also made some absolute turkeys as well. His last one was The Last Duel, and I'm going to be comparing The Last Duel to Napoleon quite a bit, I feel, because I think they've got quite a lot of similarities. Now, if you've not seen The Last Duel, it's similar to Napoleon in so much as it's it's an interesting film. It's probably worth seeing, but would I say it's a good film? Mm, potentially not. Now, I've made myself a list of positives and negatives, and I'm going to go through them. They, these are in the order that I sort of thought and they came to me. I've tried to put them in chronological order of the film. I, that's how I was thinking about it. But some of them might not quite be in the order that they appear in the film. So the first positive that I have around this film, and it's the one I think, I think it's going to be the least controversial thing I think anyone is ever going to say. The costumes are incredible. They are out of this world gorgeous now as i say i went to see it on imax and there's a scene where napoleon's carriage pulls up to the house that um josephine is now staying in now she's no longer the empress and in front and behind the coach are two chasseur a cheval of the guard and their uniforms just oh they just leapt off the screen the fur on the edges of the police you could almost touch you they were absolutely phenomenal i cannot criticize the uniforms at all i don't know who the costume department person was in this film but if they don't win an oscar then there is no justice in the world they were absolutely spectacular now there were a few historical inaccuracies i suspect though that was more editing than the film production so for example there's one scene where it's showing the battle of austerlitz there's some french cavalry and they've all got tricklers there's a later scene showing Borodino, and they've all got the lozenge flags. Now, obviously, they're the wrong way around. The lozenge flags should have been at um, Austerlitz and the tricklers at Borodino. So they obviously had them, but I suspect that's the editor. They filmed a load of battle scenes, and the editor's taken them, chopped them, and put them in the see the battle scenes they weren't originally filmed to be part of, if that makes sense. So I think that's potentially an editing issue not a filmmaking issue but apart from that the uniforms really were absolutely spectacular the only thing i've seen that comes close to them is the bbc's war and peace and even then they they didn't have the the just beauty of these ones again seeing it on imax it was a humongous screen so when they had the treaty of tilsit you had the old guard stood in two ranks away from the tent and you could see their uniforms as well. I, I made a point to look out for their uniforms in the background. Absolutely glorious. If they do a, a book, the making of Napoleon, the costumes or whatever, that is an absolute auto-buy for me. They were absolutely beyond fantastic. I loved the uniforms. It, I would say it's worth seeing just for the uniforms. Ignore the... You could even have it on mute. Just check out the uniforms. They are spectacular. Now, something that's a little bit more uneven, I found, was the cinematography. Now, really, Scott, in an interview recently, he said, I have a great eye. Nah, he used to, I have to say, I'm not really sure I'm feeling it anymore, Ridley. He had some shots that were absolutely beautiful. The crowning of Josephine by Napoleon, fantastic. Lincoln Cathedral, where that was filmed, looked really good. It was a good stand-in for Notre Dame. Uh, it's a shame they couldn't use the actual Notre Dame, but obviously for reasons of demonetization i'd better not mention why that is so uh, it's a shame they couldn't use the original uh, not jam i always remember not jam being very dark but in david's painting it's very light so it, lincoln cathedral stood in very well for that i felt the shots of the battles very good not confusing sometimes particularly in this world of like post michael bay it's difficult to work out what's going on but there were some really nice long shots of what was happening the, you'll have seen it on the trailer, the Austrian Carazio, or Dragoon maybe, who's galloping across the ice with his flag as the cannonballs hitting him. Really, really good. There's the bit where the Russians are going through the ice. And then it's, you know, it's a little bit Saving Private Ryan. It's obviously nowhere near as good as Saving Private Ryan. But there's a little bit of that in there. And when they're unveiling, the, they're pulling the canvas back from top of the cannons to reveal the Auslitz ambush for some reason. But you know, <laughs> the history is one thing, but the shot was absolutely lovely. The way they shot interiors, very nice as well. A little bit reminiscent of Stanley Kubrick. 
and when he shot Barry Lyndon. However, nowhere near as atmospheric. When uh, when Kubrick shot Barry Lyndon, he did only use candlelight. Ridley Scott obviously had you know film lights as well, but the lighting was was very good. I again, I don't know. Most of the crew in this, I think, deserve a lot of plaudits, even if the overall film was perhaps not very good. But the lighting director, very good. Not as good as Barry Lyndon, but certainly in, in that same ballpark. The locations, I thought, were very good. Um, there was a bit, uh, uh, if you've seen the, um, this is a bit distracting for me. If you've seen my review of the trailer, I think it's the second trailer. I was like, I know where that execution takes place. I just couldn't place it. And then watching the film, it, it clicked in my head. It's in Somerset House. So it's nice to see Somerset House, which is a, a good stand-in for Greenwich. I was like, well, it makes a nice change. We're not at Greenwich College. And then for the coup de Brumier, we are in Greenwich College. <laughs> it's like, okay. Well, it was fun while it lasted. And I loved the irony of the coup taking place in the room that Nelson's body lay in state in real life so you've got you know, someone recreating napoleon seizing power becoming first consul or emperor and then <laughs> in the very room where the man who hated him with every fiber of his being was laid in his chapel of rest uh, that, that, that made me chuckle anyway but that i thought was a particularly good scene again fantastic uniforms uh both the execution of marianne Swett were very well done as was the uh, the coup of de Brumier. I did find out this is this is not in any way important, but there used to be a show called Stella Street, which was where you had people doing Michael Caine impressions or uh, Al Pacino ran like the laundrette, and uh, so like, it was a mental TV show, very British. One of the main guys in that, John Sessions, he was the guy who was the executioner of Marie Antoinette in the film. I don't know why, <laughs> super weird. It was, anyway. So that was pretty good. The, the locations were very good. The interiors were good as well. The uh, house that per was used quite a lot for where Josephine lived. I think that's down in Dorset or somewhere, I think I read. That was very nice as well. It was a, a, a lot less grand than it would have been. And the, the building that stood in for Versailles, very impressive as well. So the locations, very good. Again, the location scout, great job. Can't... Uh, can't criticize them for that it's usually a woman location scouts weirdly so if it is a her can't criticize her for that the other um thing that i found about the film is the pacing now the pacing i thought was okay you seem to have around about 20 30 minutes of talky talky and then we had five or ten minutes of fighty fighty and that seemed to go along pretty much the whole film so you know fair enough now, for someone who was interested in, or ha well, not even necessarily interested, but has knowledge of the Napoleonic period, what it meant for me was that, all oh, right, okay, so we're now at the Treaty of Tilsit. So we're about halfway through the film, probably. Oh, yeah, no, here's the Battle of Borodino. Right, we're, we're going towards the end. Here's Waterloo. We are at the very end. Oh, now he's on St. Helena. So that was, you know, that, the pacing was pretty good as a gallop through Napoleon's life. It wasn't too bad. I've got some negatives about that as well. Remember, this is just I'm just going through the positive things I can say about the film at the moment. Now, talking about the battles, uh, the Battle of Toulon was very good. It was a very exciting battle. There was a lot of action in it. I, I didn't realize this, but in the actual Battle of Toulon, I only read about this last week. Napoleon was actually injured. He was stabbed in the thigh by a British sergeant's bayonet. So he was absolutely on the front lines. I did not know that. So to show him, you know, leading the charge, climbing up the ladders and all that good stuff. Yeah, uh, uh, why not? Uh, sounds reasonable to me. There's a couple of things that are going to come into the negatives, which we'll talk about in a bit. But uh, the Battle of Toulon, yeah, I, I thought the Battle of Toulon was pretty good. The Battle of the Pyramids um, was a positive and a negative. It was positive. Well, well, we'll come on to why I think it was such a positive in a bit. But um, it certainly showed a revolutionary army quite well. And yeah, it, 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 uh, yeah, it, it was okay. The other battles, as I say, they looked good. Not so much of a fan, although I did like the, the cannons blowing up the ice and killing all the Russians in the fish ponds. Again, not necessarily that historically accurate, but I thought it looked good on the screen. So this is what I'm just talking about here. As ways of like passing the time, I thought these battles were pretty good. Speaking of the battles, uh, the final one, Waterloo, 
Uh, the Duke of Wellington was played by Rupert Everett. Now, I must confess, I love Rupert Everett. I, I like it, whatever he's in. And he is absolutely the Duke of Wellington I did not know I needed in my life. I loved his Duke of Wellington. I thought he was very, very, very good. I really like Rupert Everett anyway. So I'm not going to apologise. I think he's great. I, I, I thought he did a very good job as the Duke of Wellington. Now we come into something that's going to again be a little controversial, I have a feeling. And that is Napoleon is portrayed by Phoenix and the writers as being a bit of a petulant man-baby. Now, I have to say, there's a lot of people who watch this channel who really like Napoleon. They think he's a, you know, they're, they're obviously very interesting and things like that. So this might be tough to hear, but I actually think he was a little bit of a petulant man-baby. If you read his memoirs, it's everyone else's fault. Nothing's ever his fault. Um, his love letters to Josephine, where he was, oh, no, how can you be cheating on me? While well, he's got, like, numerous mistresses. I mean, he had a, uh, a well-known affair with the uh, prin uh, Polish princess for ages. So, yeah, I, 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 him as a person, the more I've read about him, the less I've admired him personality-wise. His genius, his will, his ambition, all of that stuff I can completely... Um, appreciate and you know think and, and admire but his uh, interpersonal relationships not quite so much and that's how he comes across in the film he's very demanding he's very selfish he's um you know petulant as i say and i i suspect that's how he was now there'll be a lot of people out there andrew roberts in particular who won't agree with me on that one that's absolutely fine that's that you know this is a um a perception thing um, and, you know, if you don't like him being portrayed that way, then that's absolutely fine. Uh, I can understand why. But for me, I felt that it was reasonably accurate to how I perceive Napoleon's character. And finally, and for me, the best thing, and this is why it scores in, uh, one of the reasons it scores as an 8, scores as, why it scores an 8 for a 8 out of 10 as a Napoleonic lover, is there were a lot of little Easter eggs in there that weren't mentioned but they were there. So, for instance, when Napoleon was in Egypt, there was a black general stood behind him. So that's clearly uh, Duma. Now, Duma was only half black, and this guy was like, you know, sub-Saharan African. So, okay, yeah, fair enough. But it was nice to see him in there. Of course, if you've seen the film, you'll 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 see why I got a little bit of a hoo hoo, -hoo out of this. It's my boy Eugene. He's in it quite a lot now. He's in a separate scene where he goes to ask for his father's sword back from Napoleon, who at this point has, you know, he's in charge of Paris. But throughout the rest of the film, he's there with his little moustache in the background. He's never directly mentioned, but he's he's in and around. I really liked the uh, fact that you got to see the directory, that you got to see the coup, and that's you know, the terror and Rob Spears period, because you don't tend to see that very often, I guess, unless you're watching the Scarlet Pimpernel, I suppose, that... Um, They'll dwell on it, but the rest of it, you don't tend to see it. You either have revolution, and then it cuts straight to empire. So it was nice to see that in there as well. It was good to see um, Kulan Kors wheeler dealing his way of getting the different emperors and kings around the table. That was quite good. So I quite liked that there were a lot of Easter eggs. Those are the ones that just stuck in my mind. However... That's the end of the positives, I'm afraid. Now, I know a lot of you haven't come here for positives. You've come here for negatives. So this is the part of the video that you will have been waiting for. General Dan has been rubbing his hands with glee for me to get into tearing this film apart. But I don't think that would be fair to just rip it apart. I've seen a lot of people do that, and I think that's a shame because I think there are some positives to be taken out of this film. However, there are quite a few negatives. Now, the first one and the most important one... And this is why, as a war gamer, uh, well, I said as a war film, I guess I should have said as a war gamer, it scores so low. The battles are pretty atrocious historically. They may look good, and there's a few things in there that are historically accurate, but by and large, they are, I mean, it, it's they're so beyond historically inaccurate, it, I, I'm finding it difficult to even critique them. For instance... The Battle of Waterloo. Some people have said, well, you know, I can't work out why they get out their trenches to march down the slope to form square. I can't believe, I can't work out why they're in trenches, would be my first thing. But uh, yes, I should say as well, actually, that was a positive. I really liked the shot of them forming squares because it looked to me like there were probably about about three, about 
two and a half, three hundred people in each unit that was forming those squares, which probably would have been around about the number of people I would have done it. Maybe a few more, maybe up to four hundred. But um, that looked really good, so that was another positive. But yes, they had trenches at the Battle of Waterloo. I, 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 I can't even. A 95th rifleman with a sniper scope. I mean, um, <laughs> uh, what else did they have that was ridiculous? Obviously, we've got the, the whole fact that the Battle of Auslitz was apparently an ambush. Mm, I mean, okay. okay. Uh, in, in the, uh, you know, I may, I may do a whole separate section on Waterloo because I'm, I can feel myself getting confused and annoyed by it. So yeah, Austerlitz was very silly. Borodino, not great. Now, if you've got trenches in the Waterloo scene, why was no one dug in in the Borodino scene uh, when they actually were dug in? I don't know. Seems very odd to me. The biggest disappointment for me was the Battle of the Pyramids. I mean. Uh, okay, well, let's, let, let's let's briefly get into the scene for the Battle of the Pyramids, if you've not seen it. So it cuts to him in Egypt. He's stood in front of the Sphinx on his horse. Phenomenal shot. Just like the painting, brilliant. On the IMAX, it was absolutely spectacular. There was one thing that was missing from that shot, and we'll come on to it later, was the score. But we'll come back, we'll come back to that in a bit. So the army's lined up. You've got the... Um, the French guns lined up. And he, what he thinks is this weird thing where he puts his hands over his ears every time the artillery fires. Now, I mean, I, I, I get it. Are you, I mean, you probably would. There's a lot of uh, wargaming figures out there with their hands over their ears in artillery crew. I remember the old Empire Mortar guy had his hands over his ears. He was great. But it was just, it was like a weird affectation. It was a bit like when um, Maximus always takes the dirt out of the ground before a battle it was just it was just weird but anyway so he's got this battery of cannons and opposite him on this imax screen which must have which must be i don't know 30 meters wide 40 meters wide just one end to the other this this janissary and marmaluke army you've got marmaluke officers riding up and down you've got these janissaries in the background it looks sick as and then he fires a carronade and he hits the pyramid the guy falls off his horse and then he's won the Battle of the Pyramids. And that was it. Oh, what a massive, crashing disappointment that is. And this is something that's not going to be improved with the director's cut. Because, you know, you might say, oh, well, yeah, I really enjoyed Kulan Kaur and his like, uh, wheelie dealing. Okay, well, you might have more of that in the director's cut. You're not going to have him shooting the the, the middle pyramid or the uh, Menkare's pyramid, are you? That's just it. He just fires at the Great Pyramid of Khufu. Incidentally, he fires at the Great Pyramid of Khufu and sort of, you know, dislodges loads of dust from it and stuff like that. I mean, let, I mean, I mean, uh, well, let's say that he had a thirty-six pound cannon. Now he certainly didn't have a thirty-six pound cannon. It was probably like a four pounder. But let's say he had a thirty-six pound cannon that fires a ball that weighs thirty-six pounds. Do you know how much one of what just one of those slabs of stone that uh, hold up the you know, that the pyramids are made of? Do you know how much that weighs? The cannonball would certainly not dislodge one of them. It absolutely would not dislodge like the whole top of the Great Pyramid. So what on earth was going on there, I have no idea. As I say, he didn't even have 36 pounders. He had like four pounders. I mean, just, uh, but, uh, yeah, what a humongously wasted opportunity that was. But, you know, that was the directorial decision that he made. Just, just shocking. Uh, Austerlitz. Like I said, I really enjoyed the end of the battle. I enjoyed the uh, the firing on the ice. That was cool. There wasn't a huge amount of, of battle before that, which was a real shame, because you never got a, really a sense of peril. Now, I'm going to come back at the end to talk about the battles and their place in the film, but there was never a sense of peril that Napoleon was going to lose. Now, Austerlitz was actually pretty close until it wasn't. I, th I mean, you could say that Napoleon was in charge for the whole thing, but you know, the Allies didn't know that. It, the trap hadn't been sprung that Napoleon was going to absolutely crush them. So, yeah, I don't know. Auschwitz was okay. But, I mean, Waterloo is probably one of the most famous European battles out there. And, as I say, I, I'm, I'm going to separate Waterloo off. I'm going to do a whole separate thing on Waterloo. Now, some people have mentioned that there's no peninsula. There's no... Um, what else was there? No, no peninsula, no real retreat from Moscow. A little bit, but not much. There was no uh, like Copenhagen campaign, anything like that. So there was no Danube campaign. And, you know, the thing is you can't show all of these things. So I don't necessarily have a problem with them not showing 
Spain or the Danube or something like that. It might have been nice to have like a little bit of a montage of him taking, you know, here's Napoleon in Madrid, here's Napoleon in Vienna or, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah, no, it, it was a bit of a shame that, uh, that that didn't happen. But, you know, you can't necessarily have everything. Uh, there was no Trafalgar either. I'm not I'm not really sure why people are complaining about the lack of Trafalgar because Napoleon wasn't even at Trafalgar. So I'm not really sure why people are complaining about that. But speaking of things it doesn't show us, and this I was very, very surprised by, because I can understand not showing a full battle. D to direct the Battle of the Pyramids would have taken a lot of time, and in uh, film production, a lot of time equals a lot of money. So I can understand why you wouldn't necessarily show the entire Battle of the Pyramids. But there are many other aspects to Napoleon that would be very cheap to film that also weren't shown. Now, if you have seen the trailer, you'll remember that there's flashes up a load of single word things that are you know, words that refer to Napoleon. So it says, you know, tyrant, genius, uh, conqueror, all these kind of things. But we saw absolutely nothing about Napoleon the Emperor. We saw Napoleon the loser in the bedroom. We saw Napoleon the guy who was there on the battlefield we didn't see anything about napoleon the ruler obviously introduced the code napoleon the the basis of french law and a huge amount of european law it has to be said we saw nothing about the effect of the levy en masse would have had on the french population so it's not even necessarily that it didn't show all the positive things that he did there was none of the negative things that he did either now even in gladiator they managed to get this in where the two senators are talking, it's Derek Jacobi and the other senator, I can't remember who it is, where they talk about, the, you know, oh, I may be for the people, but I'm not from the people, and all that kind of stuff. So even, so some politics got into Gladiator, it took maybe 30 seconds, and you got to pay Derek Jacobi, who, uh, fair enough, I mean, I, I'd pay Derek Jacobi millions anyway, but you got to pay Derek Jacobi and whoever the other guy was to have two lines of dialogue each. There you go, you can film that in 50 minutes, and the second unit director can do it. So... Why there was none of that in the film whatsoever, I don't know. There certainly, uh, there certainly could be in the director's cut. That's the kind of thing that could be in there, to be honest. So I don't want to bag too much on it, just in case it is. But if you're going to have in the marketing thing, tyrant, genius, emperor, all this kind of stuff, at least show us some of that in the film. And there was none of that in the film. It was literally bedroom to battlefield back to bedroom now having seen the film i then checked out the writer and his previous credits i'm going to talk more about him in a bit because i want to discuss the failure to abide by the golden rule and why i think that's why napoleon film is ultimately a failure but his writing credits include a couple of other a uh, couple of tv series he's writing a new cleopatra film so i think i'll be giving that one a miss and he also wrote the screenplay for The Man in the High Castle. Now, I, having known that now, I can see a lot of similarities between Napoleon and The Man in the High Castle. There's a lot of... It's the, um, it's, it's the post Aaron Arkin way of making TV shows of people walking through corridors talking to each other. It's, it's post West Wing, basically. It's drama through conversation. And I think that can be done well, as it was in The West Wing. But it goes against the golden rule so it's very difficult to do well now the other thing that i briefly touched on earlier on that i was incredibly disappointed with i cannot let you know how um how how, how genuinely disappointed i was by this is the soundtrack i'm a big soundtrack guy i've been listening to quite a lot of soundtracks recently and i i, I like me an epic soundtrack uh, a lord of the rings or I've been listening to the soundtrack for Oblivion recently, the Elder Scrolls game, and Skyrim as well for that matter, but more Oblivion. I have also been listening to to the Oppenheimer soundtrack as well. And these are all big orchestral pieces. Napoleon doesn't have that. Napoleon has like you know the odd minuet or something like that. And that's basically it. And then it's very quiet, it's very incidental music. It's not an epic score. Now it's tell Ridley Scott's trying to tell an epic film, and it needs an epic score now it doesn't necessarily need to be an overwhelming score certainly oppenheimer's isn't but it needs to be a score that drives forward the the plot it drives forward the fact that these are key events that are going on that you should be paying attention to and for me the score does not do that i couldn't even think of a uh, a part of the score that really stuck out to me apart from perhaps when they're in egypt 
you've got instant Egypt noise by adding, you know, those little, like, trumpet things that they've got in the Middle East. Oh, yeah, we're definitely in the Middle East because someone's playing one of those reed trumpets. Yeah, and that was that was basically it. Very, very poor. I mean, you've got... Uh, just... You, the composer should have been trying to make pictures in your mind using the music. That's what music's there for in a film, or to help drive forward the events on the screen. And I felt he didn't do any of this. I thought the soundtrack was a crushing disappointment. I expected to put it up there along with my favourite soundtracks. Absolutely terrible. And again, Ridley Scott knows the power of a good soundtrack. Vangelis' soundtrack to Blade Runner is one of the most widely bought you know, non-lyrical albums of all time. So he knows a good score, but he, he certainly didn't get one for this film. Now, what I did uh, then is I looked into what else he'd composed the soundtrack for and to be honest it's it's kind of tv stuff we're back to really scott directing a tv movie not an actual movie movie he did things like i mean he has done movies he did the the brighton rock remake oh, okay but uh, he did do the bbc's war and peace now i spoke earlier on in glowing terms about the costumes in war and peace although they did use the same costumes for austerlitz as they did borodino for the russians so um, okay but uh, which they didn't do in this film, I should point out. But this, uh, he's a TV composer at the end of the day. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a perfectly noble profession. But compose stuff for TV, mate. Don't, don't do epic films. Leave that to Hans Zimmer. Leave the epic films to James Horner. You, you, you do t TV, buddy. That's, that's what you're good at. Stick to doing the TV. Speaking of sticking to doing TV, we are. this is going to be where my main criticism comes from. Did Ridley Scott direct a good film? No, he did not. Did he direct Napoleon well? I do not think so. Was it edited well? No, it wasn't edited well. But all of that comes down to, was it a well-written script? And the answer is, no. It was absolutely appalling. I mean, it was just awful. It was awful from my perspective as a war gamer and a fan of war films and Napoleonic history. But it was also terrible from an actual script writing perspective as well. This is one of those things where people say, can you have a, um, a, a work of art that is not subjective? There will be someone out there that thinks that their three-year-old stickman drawing is better than the Ascent of Man on the Sistine Chapel's roof. Okay, ceiling. There will be some people who think that. And they're wrong, but they will think that. So that, that's fine. But there are rules to script writing to make a good film, which is why some films are good and some films are not very good. Now, there is one in particular that is called the golden rule of script writing. And it, and it is, this is not me saying it's the golden rule of script writing, it is actually called the golden rule of script writing. And I'm going to focus on a very specific part of the film to demonstrate why this is a problem. It applies to the rest of the film as well, but this one specific part is the easiest one to illustrate it, in my opinion. So the golden rule of script writing is show, don't tell. Don't tell the audience something, show them. Don't tell the audience that Thanos is super powerful. Show him beating up Iron Man and Captain America. I don't know if he ever does, because I've never seen those films. But show him doing that rather than telling them how like deadly he is. A another great example of a Ridley Scott movie is he shows us how dangerous the alien is. He doesn't just tell us. He doesn't say, oh, that guy was found in the corridor and he'd been eaten. No, no, he shows us that scene and we see how deadly the aliens are. Another classic Ridley Scott film, we see Deckard's reaction to the replicants. Uh, the, the ultimate one for Ridley Scott of showing, not telling, is, of course, The Last Duel, where he shows us the same events from three different perspectives. Now, that's an interesting... It's, it's It was originally... Well, not originally, but it's most famously done in Rashomon by Akira Kurosawa, and it's there to show us that truth is a mutable thing. It's all to do with perspective. Ridley Scott falls down when he has his third um, segment of The uh, uh, the Last Duel, and it says, part three, the truth. And it's, well, well, the whole point of Rashomon is that there is no truth. So he's completely undermining the whole... Well, why don't you just show us the truth in the first place, Ridley? Why make me sit through these other ones first? What's the point in that? There is no point in that. That's my critique of The Last Duel. Also not a very good film. But this one I wanted to focus on... I've, I've got a little bit of a tangent there. This one 
it, as I say, I wanted to focus on a very specific point, and that's the very end of the film. So, spoiler alert if you've not seen it, but Napoleon dies in the end. I know, I know that's going to be a big shock, but he does die in the end, I'm afraid. And the final scene is he's shown on St. Helena talking to two young girls. I mean, you know, they're kids. Um, and, you know, he says, who burnt Moscow? And she says, I don't know. And he says, it was me. And then he takes a sip of water. And then the camera cuts to a shot behind him. So you've got him against the sea. And you can see his bicorn hat. And it's in it's sort of silhouette. And then he, he leans over to the left of the screen. And he falls off and he dies, effectively. The screen then fades to black. Uh, and a, a card comes up. And it says, Napoleon died on St. Helena in the day that he died. And his final words were, France, the army, Josephine. Now... This is where I have a problem. This is where Show Don't Tell comes into it. We've just seen him die. We've just seen the scene of him where he dies. And he didn't say, France, the army, Josephine. He said, who burnt Moscow? Me. So those are his last words according to what we've seen on screen. Now you could say, well, that's not him dying. That's him collapsing. And then they carry him to his bed where he actually died. Now in history, that is where he did die. He died in his bed. But why not show us that scene then? Why show us the scene of him with the girls and not the scene of him actually dying, where he could have whispered, France, the army, Josephine. What, show us, don't tell us. I mean, I've just spent 156 minutes watching your film, and then when we finally get to his final words, there's, oh yeah, stick up a card, it'll be on there. What? I mean, what? Oh, it then goes on to say, oh, he fought all these battles and 5,000 million people were killed. Okay, well, fair enough. You know, stick a card with that up on there. That's fine. It doesn't Again, you could have shown us maybe the Arc de Triomphe or something like that. But no, no. If you want to say that he was an evil guy as bad as Mr. Hankety Plankety, then whatever. But don't put up a card telling us what his last words were when you've just shown us him dying. And if you haven't shown us him dying, why haven't you shown him as dying? Dreadful, absolutely terrible. I mean, what on earth was he thinking? And this is where it comes into, as I say, he uh, was the guy who wrote The Man in the High Castle. Now, there's going to be a slight spoiler for Series 3 of The Man in the High Castle. I can't tell you what happens after this because I stopped watching halfway through Season 3 because it was that bad. But it, he he creates events that suit the story. And, that, that, and that's that's they just come out of nowhere. So The Man in the High Castle, for argument's sake, the uh, Obergruppen Fuhrer Smith has to cover up a murder. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I won't give too many spoilers. Yes, so this is the guy who's in charge of Nazi-run America. And he's like, oh, yeah, I need, to, I need to cover up this murder. So he just leaves his apartment, right, you know, puts his hood up, goes downtown, does the business, then gets back again. I'm like, do, do you, what? Do you, like, how many people do you think are going to be surrounding him at any one time? Do you think he can just walk around with no one noticing? Of course he can't. That's absolutely ridiculous. And in Napoleon, we see scenes that are this stupid. Interestingly, I think one of the scenes that many people will say, oh, stupid, that would never happen, was the most accurate, which is the one where he crawls underneath the table and he, you know, does the, does the deed with Josephine under the table. Now, that, you know, in front of all the servants and everything. Now, that probably would have happened. In fact, Louis Fourteenth used to get all these ministers of state into the boudoir where he would do the business to show that he still could. So not only was he not too embarrassing out in front of people, he actually did it in front of people. And I can, you know, I'm not saying that Napoleon did do the same thing, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did. But you'll show us that, but you won't show us him actually dying. Or if you do show us him dying, you then tell us, oh, well, you know, actually when he died, he said this. Well, we didn't, because we've just seen it. Another thing with the film, there's never any tension in the film. I mean, the, the most tense it gets is when Napoleon leads a cavalry charge at Waterloo. I mean, as I say, we're going to get on to Waterloo in its whole separate section at the end. But, I, I, I mean, what? So, again, Egypt would have been a perfect example for some peril. You saw in earlier on in the film, now, again, I'm trying to limit my criticisms here to be saying, well, you know, you could have done absolutely everything. Well, no, you, you've only got a limited budget. You can't do everything. Earlier on, we see the Battle for Toulon they, they capture the city wall, or the fort that's uh, out over the bay. They bombard the British ships, and one of the British ships explodes. So so what we get from that is, like, oh, well, you know, that attack was a success. Now, we didn't need to see the British ship explode to know that that had been a success. He captured the walls. They were all going, yeah, and waving the French flag, so we know it was a success. Later on, we see the Battle of the Pyramids, sort of, and then 
uh, Napoleon gets told that Josephine's taken a lover, which again is, is true. Uh, Ippolati, something his name was. Um, and he reads that the letters have been intercepted by the Royal Navy and published in a London newspaper, which also happened. Another nice little Easter egg there. But so he's like, okay, well, I'm off to France then. And that's it. Now, you could have put in a real sense of peril there. They could have been, you know, st stood on the Giza Plateau looking north, and then they could have seen a ship get blown up when Le Orient did blow up, because no ships blew up at the Battle of Toulon, but they certainly did during the Battle of the Nile. So that could have been, a, oh, right, I, we're trapped here now. I don't know how I'm going to get home. That You could have had a whole extra scene. Again, you didn't need to show the Battle of the Nile, but the special effect shot that they used for Toulon, they could have used that after the Battle of the Pyramids. So uh, there were some some weird decisions made that I just cannot make sense of at all. Now, the shooting of the cannon at the Pyramid, uh, 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 yeah, uh, Ridley Scott said, well, you know, uh, we just wanted to show that you conquered Egypt, so he shot the pyramid. I mean, what? Okay, I, I can understand, you know, Ridley Scott's direction of that scene was pretty good, although a little bit silly. But what on earth was the writer doing writing something like that? Oh, yeah, he conquered Egypt by shooting the pyramids. Yeah, I, I can almost see the, sc the screenplay now. Uh, you know, uh, opening shot exterior, cannon fires at pyramid, uh, end scene. Uh, what? Awful, just awful. The other thing as well that really uh, surprised me about how incompetent it was in the film is there is no character development whatsoever. I mean, whatsoever. Napoleon on St. Helena is the exact same character that watches the execution of Marie Antoinette. His perspectives on things, his facial expressions, his actual face is exactly the same between those two events. Nowhere does he go from being, you know, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a bit of a loser, and then suddenly, like, oh, yeah, I'm the master lover, or anything like that. There's nothing to do that. Or even the other way around. Oh, yeah, I'm young, and I'm, like, full of myself. And then by Waterloo, now I'm an old, decrepit guy with piles who can't sit on a horse properly. No, there's none of that. It's just, there's just, it's, 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 there's no development whatsoever. One of the things, the fascinating things about Napoleon is he almost has the hero's journey in real life. He hears the call to adventure. He takes the call to adventure. He, he suffers setbacks. He gets back on. He overcomes those setbacks. You know, there's a great story there, but none of that is in the film. In the film, it starts off with, oh yeah, he's a grumpy guy who says, if you're going to make me the, uh, if you want me to lead the defense of Paris, then I've got to command everything. And by the end of the film, he's like, yeah, it was the guy who burnt Moscow. Aha, it was me. What? There's no develop there is no reason to spend two and a half hours with that character. Because he has no character development whatsoever. Again, this is a problem with the man in the high castle. There is no character arc for anyone in the man in the high castle. And it's the exact same problem here. Now you could say, well, these are all um, you know, these these are things that interest me, because I'm a war gamer, I'm interested in Napoleon's military record. But his relationship with Josephine never changes either. So, again, I was quite excited to see this. So you have, a in the, the history, in the real life, you've got Napoleon who's a little bit gauche. He was a bit of a loser at school. And he is a provincial. You know, people used to make fun of his thick Corsican accent. It was only about ten years before he was born that Corsica actually became French. Until then, it was part of uh, the Kingdom of Sardinia, I'd imagine. Certainly part of Italy, anyway. Uh, so, yeah, so he starts off and he could have been like this little loser. He's hanging around with the Jacobins in Paris, like, you know, Paul Barras, his friend, you know, stuff like that. And as he goes in and he becomes emperor, he really comes out of himself. And this is all due to the support and the machinations of Josephine. This is what I was looking forward to. Josephine, the fact, and I said it before, the fact that she's older than Napoleon and an aristocrat meant that she understood the, the grammar, the language of moving through court, of moving through these diplomatic circles. There's none of that in the film. There's absolutely none of that whatsoever. I expected uh, Josephine to, you know, again, you know, he's like, oh, here's my, um, uh, here's my negotiation with the Emperor of Austria in 1800. Oh, yeah, it doesn't go very well. But by the Treaty of Tilsit, he's become the master negotiator. Because of Josephine saying, oh, no, you give yourself too uh, too easily to be fobbed off or whatever. You know, let's see some development of Napoleon's character. Let's see some development of the relationship. But no, there isn't. There's, there's not a lot. In fact, the only, like, sign that we see that the relationship develops is when they have to sign the divorce. Now, I think that was probably you know, something that neither of them wanted. 
but they had to do for the good of France. Well, you know, that's one of those things. Imperial families have had to do that as long as there's been imperial families. But she won't sign. He slaps her, and then she does sign. I mean, I don't know if that actually happened. I don't think it did, but it might have done. Far more interesting would have been if he wouldn't sign it and she had to slap him to get him to sign it. That would have, that would have, you know, okay, it may have suffered from being a bit, you know, I'm a strong woman who don't need no man syndrome that infects all of modern Hollywood. But at least it would have made sense in the the perspective of these characters. But as it was, oh yeah, Napoleon, yeah, he's a bit of an arsehole. At the beginning of the film, the end of the film, guess what? He's a bit of an arsehole. There's no change to him whatsoever. And frankly, that makes it quite boring. Why have I spent time with this guy? And this comes back to the point of the battles as well. What uh, uh, The battles, as well done or badly done as they are, what is the point of them? Like if you if you, you know, sit back if you've seen the film, just sit back to yourself and think, what did the battles actually bring to the film? Now, a film like Waterloo is a film about a battle. That, that's the whole point of the day. The, the, you know, the events of the battle are the plot of the film. So that's fair. That's the point of the battle in that film. But in other films, battles or you know works of fiction, battles serve a purpose. Let's have, for example, uh, War and Peace. So at the battle before the Battle of Borodino, Pierre, he believes in the revolutionary ideals, he believes that war is a great adventure, but when he sees Prince Alexei killed, when he gets blown up at the Grand Redoubt, suddenly war's not so great after all. This is a great character arc for him. Let's take another one, for example. Let's take Gone with the Wind. Before the Battle of is it Vicksburg, I think, in Gone with the Wind, she's very selfish, she's very up herself. After the battle, she realises that, well, no, there's perhaps more I can do to help other people. These battles are in the films not to provide a bit of action for the boys, although they do do that, but they serve a purpose for the characters. In this film, what did they serve? What, what did what, what was the difference between Napoleon's character before Austerlitz and Napoleon's character after Austerlitz? Well, let me tell you, there is no difference, because there's no difference in his character from the start of the film to the end of the film. So there certainly isn't after that one battle. Now, you could have said, well, the battles are a contrast. So Napoleon, he's a bit of a loser in the bedroom. He doesn't really know what he's doing. But when it comes to the battlefield, he's the absolute master general. You know, so he can control men, but he couldn't control his woman. There you go. There's a good tagline for you. But you don't even get that either. So, for instance, at the Battle of Austerlitz, you know, he's sat in his tent. He's looking super grumpy, which is fair enough. You know, it was cold. And um, his ADC comes in and he says, we are uncovered. And Napoleon says, good. And then they uncover the guns and they blow up the allies. Well, the the point of an ambush is not to be like discovered at all. The point of an ambush is you only get discovered when you open fire, by which time everyone's dead. So even on the battlefield, he doesn't do very well. All right, he, he probably does at the pyramids by managing to blow the capstone off the pyramids with his Uber's ultimate mega cannon. He manages to to subdue the entirety of Egypt, which incidentally never happened either. Egypt had loads of revolts against Napoleon. Why didn't we see any of the uh, assassination attempts on Napoleon? That would have been an absolutely fantastic character development thing there. He's beloved by everyone. Someone throws a bomb at his carriage and Josephine got injured. In fact, if it hadn't been for Josephine uh, sort of messing around with a shawl that she'd just been given, she actually would have been killed by that bomb. So, again, it goes back to that we don't see any of the... Um, we don't see any of the rule of Napoleon. The assassination attempts, I mean, one of them, that could be in the director's cut. But if it is, so what? It doesn't change their characters by any stretch of the imagination, unless they have a huge change in all the stuff that got edited out, and then they're back to square one at the end of the film. Maybe that'll be the message of the director's cut. I don't know. I very much doubt it, though. So while Ridley Scott's getting a load of heat, and don't get me wrong, he made some absolutely moronic comments. Uh, how do you know what happened at the battle? Were you there? No, I wasn't there, knobhead. But there were plenty of people who were, and they've all written memoirs about it. So, yeah, we do know what happened, you idiot. I think the writer, who also has his name on the poster, deserves as much opprobrium, if not more, than Ridley Scott does. Although, Ridley Scott did direct that and didn't tell him to go back and write it again. So, yeah, maybe he is party to blame as well, because he was a producer on the film after all. Speaking of being a producer, there's other stuff that he didn't show that would have cinematically been absolutely spectacular. But they decided not to. So, for instance, you've got Austerlitz. You could have had a scene that shows how beloved by the army he is. So he's not just in there to be cool, but it's in there to actually show part of his character. And you could have had the torchlit parade 
on the night before Austerlitz. That would have showed how beloved by the army he was. Yeah, here's, well, here's another example. Well, in fact, no, 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 we'll get into that when I talk about the Waterloo. But that would have been a, f a fantastic example. Now, I checked on Amazon, and you can buy... Um, let me have a look. You can buy six tiki torches for 13 quid. Okay, so if he'd had 120 of those torches, then that would have cost 260 quid. So there you go. He could have filmed the entire torchlit parade of Napoleon through the camp on the eve of the Battle of Austerlitz on the anniversary of his coronation, a man showing that he was an emperor beloved by the army, and it would have cost you uh, 260 quid. Well, I'll tell you what, Ridders, I'll be a producer in your next film. Let's get that let's let's get that scene going on. You know what? Let's even get back and, and refilm that scene now. We could probably do it for about ten grand. But no, no. So stuff like that that was missed out. There was such an easy win. I I I I have no doubt in my mind that if Ridley Scott knew that actually happened, he'd have included it in the film. But he appears to have done absolutely no research into Napoleon whatsoever. I don't know who the onset advisor was, but they obviously didn't listen to him. Apart from when it came to costumes, because the costumes are spectacular. But we've got no indication from the film of people's attitudes towards Napoleon. He almost lived in a bubble in the film, which really, really disappointing. I mean, that, that, that for me, uh, you know, I came out of it and I'm like, well, what was the point of the film? My brother is a great um, person to quote here. It's not often I say that, Paul, but uh, here we are. Um, he said, uh, I went into the film not really knowing much about Napoleon. And I have to say, coming out, I don't think I'll learn any more about him. And to be honest, that was exactly my thought as well. I thought, if I didn't know anything about Napoleon, I'd come out and I'd be like, okay, okay. I don't know anything about him. Apart from the fact that he wasn't very good in the boudoir and he slapped his missus when he divorced her. There, there you go. Those are like the two things I know about Napoleon coming out of that film. Oh, yeah, and he shot the pyramid as well. Okay, so that's the end of the, the general negative, negative part. Now we're going to get into a, a much more specific area, which is not designed to be negative, but it's going to be negative. I'll warn you about that now. Because we're going to talk about the most famous European battle of all, we're going to talk about the Battle of Waterloo and how it is portrayed in the film. <sighs> right, okay, so it starts off, and the, the first problem is it's raining all of the day of the battle, or certainly all of the morning of the Battle of Waterloo. Why? Again, why? Why not just have him... Sa so he's sat in his tent, and it's raining outside. Why not have him sat in his tent at night time, and it's raining outside? It would be exactly the same. Instead of the lion being, we don't know when the rain will stop, sire. We don't know when the ground will be dry. Just say, the rain will stop in the morning, sire. But we don't know if the ground will be dry soon. There you go. How much extra did that cost? Nothing. You know, well, these guys getting paid by the word? I don't think so. So... Again, why was that decision made? Stupid decision. Completely pointless, completely meaningless. Something that it would have driven home if they'd had the rain the night before the battle is how miserable the 100 days was for everyone involved. That could have been quite a useful thing. If, if the whole point of the film was to say, oh, Napoleon didn't care about his men, he was hankety-plankety in a bicorn hat, then that would have perfectly shown that, wouldn't it? But no, no, we'll just have it during the day. Uh, uh, okay, okay. And we'll have it in his camp that is... I mean, uh, literally, uh, uh, what, two feet behind the front lines? I mean, it, 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 there's, there's like, uh, there's a, there's probably a little bit, there's probably the width of a horse. So what, four feet. So uh, let, let's be generous. Let's say that the French camp is ten feet back from their front lines at the Battle of Waterloo. I mean, come on. I mean, I mean come on. Really? What, why? What, why was that decision made? It makes no sense whatsoever. It doesn't... It doesn't become part of the battle, although it did in Austerlitz, which, which you know, I'm not even talking about that. So, what a stupid decision to make. So, not only have you got the camp about 10 feet away from the French front line, in front of the French front line, they've dug in. They've dug loads of trenches. Uh, uh what? Okay, on the British side, we've got the same thing. Now, as I said earlier on, we've got Rupert Everett as the Duke of Wellington. Loved Rupert Everett as the Duke of Wellington. Uh, more of that, please. I'm watching the whole film just about the uh, Duke, of, uh, Duke of Wellington played by Rupert Everett. That was great. But he's, you know, he's riding a boot, and there's a guy with a Baker rifle with a, with a uh, telescope on top. He's like, oh, the, uh, the Emperor is in range. Shall I fire? Oh, no, generals have got better things to do than shoot each other all day. I mean... The thing is, if you're going to echo, I mean, okay, that, that was said at the time, but if you're going to echo a line from a more famous film, do it well. 
I mean, that was embarrassingly poor. I mean, just awful. Awful. Uh, not Rupert Everett's fault, though, I hasten to add. So then the battle starts, and the, the British are in their trenches for some reason. Uh, and then they're fighting away, and then the uh, they come out and form square. Or did they come out and form square, or did the cavalry charge happen first? I can't remember. I'd, I'd turn off by this point. At, at one point, there is a cavalry charge, and the British form square, which which was cool. I really liked that. Some people are complaining that they form square on the forward edge of the slope, where it is in history, it would, obviously, it was on the reverse slope. But I don't mind that so much, because you've got to try and get everything in one shot. So I don't mind that so much from a film perspective, that makes sense. The camera was quite high anyway. I don't know if they used... I, I don't think they used a drone, though. I think it was probably a crane shot. Now, if you think of the uh, Waterloo film, the Sergei Mondachuk one, you've got helicopter shots in that where it goes over all the squares being surrounded by cavalry. Fantastic shots. Much easier to do now with CGI and drones. Decided not to do it. Use an old-school crane shot instead, which... It's a little bit boring. It's a bit static, but okay. That's fair enough. Ridley Scott, you know, he's an old-school director. And then there's a charge of the French infantry, not the guard, hasten to add, but just the, the regular French infantry, and Napoleon rides at the head, and he starts cutting down English soldiers with abandon, like he's some sort of Warhammer fantasy fourth-ed special character, with, I don't know, plus two to wound the sword of the Imperial Revolution, or something like that, I don't know. But, um, yeah, again, absolutely ludicrously stupid. Why they put that in there, I have absolutely no idea. And, again, the, the main problem I've got with it is not only is it historically inaccurate, not only is it stupid, but it doesn't show any character development. In fact, if anything, it shows the opposite of character development. It shows that he's the same gung-ho guy at Toulon than he was at Waterloo. Which, considering the guy couldn't sit down on his horse properly, it is going some, really, isn't it? But here's another little bit of show and don't tell. And this really boils my piss, because it was such a perfect opportunity for them to put something in, to again show a bit of Napoleon's personality that doesn't cost any more. In fact, they do the entire scene with the wrong person. So the French guns are ranging in on the British lines, and, you know, the uh, the gun commander says, oh, no, no, the, the ball's firing short, I think, or it's firing long, I think it fires short. So, you know, elevate by two degrees or whatever. So they elevate the cannon, they turn the screw that lifts the cannon up, and they fire again, and it hits the English lines. So, fine, perfect, no problem with that at all. I should point out as well, it does. it is the English, or the British lines in this case, because there, there seems to only be the guard there. That was it, there was just a guard regiment at Waterloo. But anyway, now, Napoleon famously would sight his own cannons, at, uh, particularly early on in his career, particularly at Toulon. Now, it didn't show him doing it at Toulon. It doesn't show him doing it at Waterloo either, but it could well have been. We've got a scene of a cannon being laid, and then it has to be raised to fire further. Fair enough. Why not show Napoleon doing that? As I said, that was one of the few things that he's famous for, the little corporal, because he would lay his own guns. He could have done that at Toulon, and then you could have shown him doing that at Waterloo. If he'd been on a massive character arc, you could say, look, everything's changed about Napoleon. He's gone from being this poor middle-class kid to being emperor of the world, and he's soon going to be emperor of like a small island. In fact, he wasn't even emperor of the small island. He's just going to be some dude on a small island. But in spite of all of these big changes, at heart, he's still a little corporal. He's still the guy who who like sights the guns. But he didn't do it at Toulon, and he didn't do it at Waterloo in the film. What again, What was the point in showing that scene if you're not going to have Napoleon laying the guns? What what, what, what what purpose did it serve? If they'd fired the first cannon and it had hit the English lines, the, the story would have been served just as well as them doing it on the second attempt. Or it could have been the hundredth attempt. It wouldn't have made any difference, would it? It, 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 it? If they'd said... Oh, yeah, well, the supplies are short, my lord. We've only got enough cannonballs for two cannon uh, shots per cannon. And then they missed with the first one. At least there would have been a bit of tension there. But no, there was none of that. It was just, oh, yeah, oh, he's missed the first time. Range in the second time. Oh, yeah, he's done it now. Uh, fire for effect. What? What? You just wasted my time, mate. You wasted 90 seconds of my life. So why? These are the decisions which they don't cost any more. They're not difficult to write. I've, I've just written the scene for you. And I'm no screenwriter. They're not difficult to film. Joaquin, go and cite that cannon. Look down that site as if you know what you're doing. I'm sure Joaquin Phoenix is capable of doing that. He's a good actor. 
But no, they didn't have that. They just had the gun captain say, oh yeah, elevate the gun by two degrees, boom, yeah, all the British are dead. Uh, d d what? Just, I mean, come on, man. As uh, the most popular president of America would say, come on, man. Uh, I mean, it was, it was just little things like that that made me so frustrated. It's not that I hated the film. I actually quite enjoyed the film. As I say, from a uh, someone with the knowledge of Napoleon, I'd give it a, a, maybe a 7 out of 10. Maybe 8 was a little bit overly generous. 7 out of 10. But it's just little things like that that could have bumped it up to the next level. It's It just shows a lack of care and attention and effort. And that's... I, I'm not angry at Napoleon. I'm disappointed. I think that's the perfect way... I can sum up the film, and I think I'm going to end the review there. Thank you for staying with it as long as you have. It's been a bit ranty in places. I don't want to give the impression that I hated the film, because I didn't. I thought about going to see it again to prep for this, but I, ju I just couldn't face seeing it a second time. I would recommend that people do go and see it at the cinema, because I think you're going to enjoy it more at the cinema than you would on TV. And let's be honest, if you're into the Napoleonics, you're going to watch it at some point anyway. So you may as well watch it on the cinema. But would I say, yeah, rush out, get your uh, 50 quid popcorn and your 200 pound 3D 4X mega mega? No, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest any of that. I'm glad I saw it on IMAX. I'm certainly not going to go see it again, though. I will probably watch it when it comes out on Apple+. Plus. I shall sail the seven seas and watch it there. But, um, yeah, no, unfortunately, I went in wanting to love Napoleon. There seems to be a bit of a feeling in the community of the like, the more real, uh, in inverted commas, the more OG Napoleonic fan you are, the more you hate the movie. I, I, that just comes across as being a bit silly to me. That sort of elitist attitude that, unfortunately, does exist with some people in the community. But I, I, I don't feel like that at all. I felt like there was the possibility for it to be good. As I say, there, there are certain weird scenes in there that, that are so so close to greatness, to uh, quote another terrible modern film. Um, we were this close. But um, no, unfortunately, as I say, I, I don't hate the film. I think one of the things that's, that's maybe helped me deal with it as well, speaking of Star Wars, as I've just referenced there, is films like the new Star Wars, the new Indiana Jones film that my brother dragged me to go and see. Good, good God alive. Because I've been able to disassociate myself from such terrible... I mean, the last Indiana Jones film was probably probably the worst big budget film I've ever seen. I mean, it's not the worst film I've ever seen. I've seen, like, Rug Munchers from Mars. Believe you me, that's worse than Indiana Jones. But it's, 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 it's the worst big budget film I think I've ever seen. So it wasn't as bad as that. Let's be honest, it wasn't as bad as that. I'm not angry with Ridley Scott. I'm just really, really disappointed.